Thank you. 
Um, two uh, worship detail related items. The first being uh, the, the bulletin indicates lessons in the celebrate. As you've already probably figured out, we are not using the celebrates this morning, so that is, is not the case. Uh, so two things about that. One, if you normally use the celebrate for your weekly devotions, as I do and as, as several people do, so if you would like a copy of the celebrate, I have them on the front corner of the desk closest to the office door, if you would like to pick one of those up, today's celebrate would be available. Um, also, Psalm 128 is in the song section of the Red Hymnal. As you've noticed, we don't really have page numbers, unfortunately. I'm not sure who thought that was a good idea in putting together the Red Hymnal, but for some reason we do not. So what you need to do is look right before the hymns appear the psalms, and once you get into the psalms, you'll find Psalm number thus and such, and you can navigate your way then to Psalm 128 if you want to go ahead and look that up and have that ready to go. Um, a couple of thank yous which seem appropriate on this thank offering day. Uh, the first would be to the, the star crew who placed the steeple stars last Sunday afternoon um, after inclement weather had delayed it from uh, the days before that. Um, if you haven't noticed, when you leave the church this morning, take a quick look up. The stars look quite different, and that is because they are, uh, I guess we could say, rather new high-tech stars. And uh, it represents a lot of creativity on the part of our amazing property committee and the help and support of other folks outside the congregational family. Uh, we'll be saying more about them in a few weeks when we light them. And that will be coming up on December 2nd. But for now, uh, I just want to lift up the idea that, again, it shows the pretty incredible things that St. John Congregational Family is capable of. In this case, a redesign that will both save a tremendous amount of energy and also make the stars from now on much, much, much safer to install than they have been in the past. So, again, stay tuned for further information about our new stars. And do look up when you leave this morning and check them out. Um, I want to say also a thank you to you all for your good and, and hard and faithful work in the Strawberry Festival. We don't always get a chance from the local benevolence committee which oversees how those monies are directed for various benevolences. We don't get a chance to report to you and I want to do better about that because it is worth you all knowing the good things that are happening with the resources that come from that hard work all the way back in June. Just this week, we issued checks of $800, $500 to the Community Meal Ministry. Uh, that is the free supper that happens once a month at either Salem UCC or Trinity United Methodist in Eville. Since we cannot really host it, not being there in the center of town, we provide, as do some local businesses, financial and logistical help. And so with our Strawberry Festival money, $500 is making possible a Christmas gift that everyone will receive who attends the holiday meal coming up in a couple of weeks. So without that money, the uh, community meal program would not have been able to take on that expense. The other thing that is happening through your hard work at the Strawberry Festival is we've given $300 to the Upper Dauphin Area Human Services Center. That's the one in Likens that used to be across from the library in Eville for their holiday food distribution. They were in a position of not having enough money 
to complete buying the turkeys and the other things that they needed. So with that $300 shot in the arm, they will now have the resources to finish up everything that they need for their holiday food distribution. So just two examples of the things that happen all through the year because of the hard work that happens way back in those very hot days of summer. So thank you for that. Um, a couple of things that we are uh, looking for. One is uh, altar flower sponsors. If you have not noticed downstairs on the altar flower chart, December is pretty much mostly open. And so it would be really great to have sponsors, especially for the earlier Sundays, because Yolanda, our coordinator, needs to know who is, is doing what as soon as possible. Uh, you'll notice that uh, Christmas Eve flowers are there and available to be sponsored. So if you've kind of been thinking about doing something like that and would be interested in sponsoring flowers in December, please stop by the sign-up sheet down on the closet door in the foyer. Um, I'm also looking for lectors, readers, for the month of December. Uh, Daryl and Janet find themselves unable to serve this December as they normally do. And so I would be interested in folks who might be interested in reading. Uh, basically, all of the Sundays in December, except the very last one, December 30, and also Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve at 4 o'clock and Christmas Eve at 8 o'clock. If you would uh, like to read the lessons on one or more of those dates, please just check with me after and we'll get you signed up and make sure that you have the lessons that you'll need then for December. Thank you for, for considering that. Uh, please don't miss the fact that right after worship we do have the Christmas decoration party and pizza party with Miss Laurie, and that our youth group is going to be getting together following that for some time this afternoon. Worship and Music Committee meets Tuesday evening. Members of the committee, uh, please note that. Uh, community Thanksgiving Eve worship, that will be this Wednesday at 7 o'clock, and we have the honor of hosting that, so we will be right here at 7 p.m. Wednesday evening. Um, on Friday evening, our youth group, which didn't make it in the bulletin, but the older youth are going to be serving with the Bethesda Mobile Mission in Harrisburg while the younger members watch a movie, so they know about that, but it's worth sharing with the whole congregational family that our youth and advisors are busy uh, in those days after, after uh, Thanksgiving Day. Next Sunday, please note the slightly different time on adult Sunday school opening because of a movie that is being shown. Christmas Eve music, we have a note in the bulletin now about men's choir and about the need for other music. I hope you'll consider uh, sharing those. The Angel Tree is back by the door. Uh, please see Faye Nichols if you would like to be a part of that annual project. <coughs> and last but not least, I did want to say a word again about the Living Lutheran as I try to each month. Uh, the latest issue, November, talks about uh, the work that we do in God's name with the ELCA theme, God's Work, Our Hands. Always worth reading, two copies available in the library downstairs. But I wanted especially to lift up October, which I neglected to do last month, and mention that on the cover is a note about an article on heaven and hell, the perspective that we have as Lutheran Christians. And I would very much commend that to you. It's really extremely well done. And uh, I would just say don't go there looking for exact answers, as sadly we Christians often do. And as sadly many Christians want to try to say they have the exact answers. Uh, this article lifts up the fact that the Bible itself says some different things, in fact, about hell and heaven and what happens when we die. We believe in the reality of both, but for the details and pretty much everything else, we just leave that to God because that's what the Bible does. So we, we take God at God's word, it's real, but we don't pretend that we have a lot of answers that the Bible itself does not provide. So I would highly commend that to you, Heaven and Hell, the feature article in the October Lutheran. Two copies of that also available downstairs in the library by the elevator. Janet, our president of the women's group. No, that's good. <laughs> I just want to remind people that next week is the last week of November already, so I'm sorry to forget that. Um, but the
we'll all be thinking a lot about filling on Thursday, so let, let's keep filling. That's that's really a bad segue, isn't it? But, yeah. Oh, well, thank you. It's the best I have, really. All right, with that then, uh, any other announcements for the good of the order that we missed, uh, please be sure to see your bulletin. And we'll turn then to Judy on the bench this morning for the prayer of the day. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Good morning, and welcome to our thank offering service. I'm going to acquaint you a little bit with the history of the women of the ELCA. It's very interesting. Uh, a lot of information I didn't know till Faye gave this to me and asked me if I'd be willing to read it. Um, it it's good to know our history, and this is our history. So, 
Lutheran women in the United States have been gathering in missions since the 1800s, and we owe much to our foremothers who responded to God's call, created a place, and lived out a purpose when women had absolutely no voice in the church. Three groups came together in 1987 to form, to form women of the ELCA. These groups were the American Lutheran Church Women, uh, the Lutheran Church Women, and Women in Action for Mission, which was part of the Association of Evangelical, Evangelical Lutheran Churches. The Constituting Convention was held in June of 1987 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and the theme was Embrace God's World. The organization was officially made an organization and constituted January 1st, 1988 with the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Communication tools would soon follow. The magazine Lutheran Women Today, pardon me, Lutheran Women Today began publishing in January of 1988 and newsletter the predecessor to Interchange followed in June of that same year. The organization's first website was inaugurated in 1995. Cafe, our electronic magazine for young women, launched in 2006 with podcasts that soon followed. In 2011, Lutheran Women Today changed its name to Gather and continued providing award-winning content, Bible studies and articles, to more than 45,000 readers with a pass-along rate of three additional people per subscriber. The organization's first smartphone app, Daily Grace, was unveiled in 2011. The same year, that magazine took on a new name, Gather. Various program initiatives were launched in 1988, some of which continue today, such as our scholarship program. Initiatives came and went, meeting the needs of the women at the time. Raising up healthy women and girls, the organization's health initiative began in 2005. Bold Women's Day, an annual celebration of our mission and the women who accomplish it launched in 2007. Today, that or the organization is active in approximately 7,000 of the 9,200 ELCA congregations and in 64 of the 65 synods. The only synod without a synodical organization is the Slovak Zion Senate, which is the only ELCA non-geographical Senate. Our purpose hasn't wavered since we created our first constitution. As a community of women created in the image of God, called to discipleship in Jesus Christ, and empowered by the Holy Spirit, we commit ourselves to grow in faith, affirm our gifts, support one another in our callings, engage in ministry and action, and promote healing and wholeness in the church, the society, and the world. Since constituting in 1988, women of the ELCA have belonged to the, pardon me, women of the ELCA has belonged to the women. It is self-incorporated. No money from the ELCA budget is given to women of the ELCA, and all monetary support comes from the women themselves. Thanks to you, women of the ELCA continues its ministry today. And I just want to tell you from a local standpoint, and I'm not living here, I'm going off the script. <coughs> we have a very active women's group. We do a lot of work on behalf of Snap Pack, something I am tremendously proud of that we do through our breaking bread, through our filling the pews, and our Italian dinner. We do a lot of hard work. We're a small group, but we are a mighty group. 
And if you are looking for an organization to become part of that just is working for a lot of good, I encourage you to come and be part of this. Thank you. Our logo with a cross, water, and a white lily identifies women of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America as children of God. Baptized, forgiven, adopted into God's family, full of grace and hope in eternal life. It is a reminder of the growth, beauty, and vitality that rises out of the life-giving baptismal water. It is also a reminder of the mission of the church to go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, and of the name of the Son, and of the name of the Holy Spirit.
first reading today is recorded in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, beginning with the 21st verse. Be subject to one another out of the reverence for Christ. Wives, be subject to your husbands as you are to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ, the head of the church, the body of which he is the Savior. Just as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, in order to make her holy, by cleansing her with the washing of water by the word, so as to present the church to himself in splendor, without a spot or wrinkle or anything of the kind. Yes, so that she may be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as they do their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hates his own body, but he nourishes and tenderly cares for it, just as Christ does for the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two will become one flesh. This is a great mystery, and I am applying it to Christ and the church. Each of you, however, should love his wife as himself, and the wife should respect her husband. Here ends the reading. be reading Psalm 128 Respondent. It's in the front of the book. There's your page number. Happy are they all who fear the Lord and who follow in God's way. Your wife shall be like a fruit vine within your house, your children like olive shoots around about your table. The Lord bless you from Zion and make you see the prosperity of Jerusalem on the days of your life. May you live to see your children's children, may you peace on Israel. children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Here at the second reading.
In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Here ends the gospel. <laughs> Executive Director of the Lutheran Camping Corporation in Central Pennsylvania. She's held these responsibilities since the year 2000. 
a graduate of Juniata College and a Lutheran Theological Seminary at Gettysburg, Sister Mary Ann has a keen interest in Lutheran culture as is lived in this part of the United States. She, her research often finds her wandering in old cemeteries or searching congregational archives. And it is her view that everyone has a story worth telling. And she loves collecting these stories and sharing them with others. Mary Ann and her husband, Sister Mary Ann, I should say, and her husband, Pastor John Brock from Trinity Lutheran Church in Camp Hill, have two grown sons, two fabulous dogs, and what some might consider an unhealthy relationship with Walt Disney World. <laughs> Welcome, Sister Mary Ann. That was a good introduction. I think I wrote it. <laughs> Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. For the past 19 years or so, I have served as the director of Camp Nawakwa, and while 19 years seems like a good chunk of time, Nawakwa, formerly known as the Lutheran Leadership Training Camp of the old United Lutheran Church in America, has been around since 1929, so I am frequently reminded that I'm still new. Nawakwa's history is a really fascinating one, and I rarely travel anywhere within the Lutheran world that I don't run into someone who tells me that they, or their parent, or their grandparent, went to Nawakwa back before I was born. And it's been my joy to be the curator of artifacts like photographs, and devotionals, and fellowship keys, and diplomas from former campers. And they send them to me with notes that say, these things are important to me, but I don't think my children will need them. And then I gladly accept those and I treasure them. But more than the items, I treasure the stories that go with them. And I have become, as we have heard, the keeper and the teller of Nawakwa's stories. And it gives me great joy to be that person. Sometimes the stories just come to me. And sometimes I have to look pretty hard to find them but nearly always the work is more than worthwhile, and such has been the case with my work around a woman whose name is Alice Geese. I first ran across Alice's name one day while I was poring over a list of the faculty in an old Nawakwa yearbook. The camp published these um, yearbooks from 1941 until about 1965, and the books contained photos and essays from campers and staff about the summer season, and then in the back, they listed the names and the addresses of the faculty and the staff and the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of campers who attended the session that year. And at the time, Nawapa was the only camp like it. So there were campers from all over Pennsylvania, Maryland, and surrounding states. And it might seem a little odd to you that I would be reading those lists of names for fun, but I find it fascinating. Because in reading those names, I run across the names of people who I know or knew, and I find names of pastors and <coughs> bishops and people in congregational leadership, because as a leadership training camp, Nawakwa was very, very successful. Anyways, I was reading uh, the list of faculty from 1954, and I noticed the name Alice Dietz. And the reason that her entry caught my eye was because her address was Lankanaw Hospital. And like in a hospital, has a long connection with the deaconess community. So that meant something to me. But it also happens to be the school of nursing that my mother attended in the 1960s. So curious about this, I started looking through the Nawakwa archives to see if I could find anything else to tell me about Alice. And there wasn't much to find except a few photos, one of which showed Alice as a young nurse, a young nurse with a rather prominent nose, and tending to the scraped knee of a female camper. And the only specifics I have um, about her were these yearly appearances in the yearbooks where her address was listed as Philadelphia or Lankanaw Hospital or University of Pennsylvania and then finally Liberia. Now I'm going to skip over the details of my search for apps, which took me two and a half years of on and off work. And the reason I'm going to skip it is because it makes me sound like a stalker. <laughs> and 
not a very good one. Suffice to say that I uh, used all the resources I had, including the archives at the library at the Gettysburg Seminary. And Roberta, who worked in the seminary archives, got caught up in the fun of this. And so she and I spent a lot of time uh, looking through old magazines, old copies of the Lutheran magazine. Um, and she managed to find some publicity photos from the Board of Missions showing a capping ceremony with Alice Dietz and her nursing students. And then in another one, there was a photograph of Alice um, with her students, and the caption read, Alice Dietz, teaching nurses how to make a bed with a patient still in it. <laughs> it's a skill. In fact, Roberta infused new life into my search for Alice, because one day she said to me, you know, if she graduated from nursing school in 1948, she might still be alive. <laughs> so with Roberta's research, or with Roberta's help and my stalking or research or whatever you want to call it, we were able to piece together the story of Alice, a woman who studied and taught nursing in Philadelphia and who became a missionary in Liberia, teaching in a nursing school uh, at a hospital there, and who, in 1972, wrote a master's thesis for the University of North Carolina on why a collegiate school of nursing is not practical in sub-Saharan tribal Africa. But after 1972, we were unable to find any more information. That's where the trail ended. Now, I also enlisted the help of my contacts in Nawaku's constituency, and I would share that <coughs> photograph that I told you about, about Alex and the camper with the scraped knee. And I would ask people, do you remember Alice Dietz? And several people remembered Alice, but no one knew what had become of her. And nearly everyone would ask me, who's that girl with the skinny knee? And I would always say, I don't know, but if I ever meet Alice, I'm going to ask her. Now let's fast forward to a Friday in August of 2011, when I was enjoying a quiet evening at home after a summer of summer camp, and I was sitting there reading my 1967 yearbook of the United Lutheran Church in America, you know, like you do. <laughs> like I do. And I paged through until I got to the list of the current missionaries, and I saw the name Alice E. Dietz, New Phoebe Hospital, Liberia. And I stopped short. Because up to that moment, I had not noticed <coughs> Alice's middle initial. And now I could narrow down my internet research to try to determine if Alice was still alive. And so I immediately plugged Alice E. Dietz into that great research tool, whitepages.com. And two entries popped up. One was an Alice E. Dietz in Iowa, which was not helpful to me. And the other was an Alice E. Dietz in Burlington, North Carolina. I had found my Alice. And so I did what any reasonable person would do on a Friday night at 7.30. I called the number. And when Alice answered, I was trembling, and I was concerned with, I think, good reason that she might think I was a kook. But I told her my name, and she immediately said, you'll have to speak up. I'm 89 years old, and I'm very hard of hearing. <laughs> so I spoke up, and I slowed down. And I told her I was calling from Nawakwa. And she said, I went to Nawakwa. And I said, I know. <laughs> anyway, the conversation on the phone was pretty difficult, and I tried to explain that I had been searching for her without sounding creepy, and we ended up, I ended up with me telling her that I was going to write her a letter, and I would explain everything, minus a few of the creepier details. And that is how, a few weeks later, I found myself walking into Alice Dietz's room at Twin Lakes Retirement Community in Burlington, North Carolina. And I'm really happy that I did, because Alice's story was even better than the one that I had uncovered. So get comfortable. <laughs> so when I got to Alice's room, Alice was sitting on the side of her bed with her tiny little feet dangling over the side. And on the rolling table in front of her was her breakfast tray with some uneaten bits of eggs and some toast and her tea in a glass of water. <laughs> they never left. She looked up and she said, you must be the lady from Nawakwa. And I assured her I was. And I handed her the gift that I had brought for her, which was a small framed copy of that photo of Alice with the camper with the scraped knee. And Alice looked at it and she said, oh, that's me. And I said, I know. And she said, who is that girl? <laughs> Our visit began with very little pretense. We had Nawakwa in common. That was enough. 
up. And Alice knew that I was there for her story, so she launched right into it. And for the next four hours, I listened. And that profoundly changed me. And it changed the way I view many aspects of my own life. Alice began by telling me that she has always had a strong faith and a love for the Lutheran Church. And that had shaped and supported her her entire life. And it was a life that didn't begin well. Alice was born in March of 1922 in the midst of a flu epidemic in Philadelphia. And in the week that she was born, her mother and two of her siblings died. So Alice and her remaining sister, Virginia, were sent to live at the Lutheran Home for the Aged and Orphans in Germantown, Pennsylvania. And we should stop right here and note, it, note that Alice loved it there. And she recalled that orphanage with, and its staff with great fondness. Several years later, Alice's father remarried, and he brought the children home which sounds like a really good turn of events, except that Alice's father abused his daughters in unspeakable ways. So when Alice's sister left home and the situation became intolerable, knowing that her father's behavior patterns were not going to change, Alice ran away. And she found refuge with family friends of her stepmother who allowed her to work in their family business until she graduated from high school. Alice belonged to a Lutheran congregation that had a strong interest in developing leadership in its young people, and they had sponsored Alice's sister's involvement in the Luther League, and they sent her off to national conventions. Alice had different interests. Um, she wasn't so interested in the Luther League, but she was interested in academic pursuits. So that same congregation sent Alice to the Lutheran leadership training camp at Milwaukee. And Alice really enjoyed her classes there. But even more, she enjoyed hearing the faculty and the visitors talk about their work in the church and in the world. And she was captured by the stories told by the deaconesses and the missionaries she met at Nawakwa. And it didn't take her long to discern that a career in nursing would be perfect for her. So she enrolled as a student at the Langdon Hospital School of Nursing outside of Philadelphia. And after graduation, she worked at other local hospitals, including the University of Pennsylvania Hospital, which allowed her to earn a BS in nursing and a master's in education at no cost. And she also served in the United States Cadet Nurse Corps in the 1940s. Now, not all of Alice's life was about education and work. Along the way, she met a young serviceman from Carlisle named Lyle Ferguson. And when she told me his name, I said, Lyle from Carlisle? And she just <laughs> grinned and she said, yeah, Lyle from Carlisle. She and Lyle did really well together and they decided that someday they would get married and they began to make plans. And on Lyle's army salary, he even managed to buy Alice a ring. Alice knew that marrying Lyle would likely mean that she would have to leave her own career behind. She grieved that, but they were happy and they were excited about beginning a life together and starting a family. And Alice felt certain that this was God's plan for her. And everything seemed to be going along swimmingly until Lyle went home on leave to his parents' farm. And while test driving his father's new tractor, he had an accident and he was killed. Mm -hmm. Alice told me that she did two things when she heard the news of Lyle's death. The first was that she sent her ring to Lyle's mother because that seemed like the right thing to do. The second thing Alice did was that she began to pray in earnest, asking God, what is it that you want me to do? Alice told me that over time it became clear to her that missionary work would be her direction, and she didn't grieve that answer. She was pretty excited about that. She remembered her classes and the conversations with the missionaries at Nawakwa, and it sounded exciting and fulfilling to her. Missionary work would allow her to use her skills and her knowledge for the sake of others, and she could give back to that very church that had formed her. And Alice knew exactly where she wanted to go. She wanted to go to Africa, specifically Tanganyika, which we now call Tanzania. She remembered learning of the many various mission fields served by the ULCA when she was at Nawakwa, and someone who was there from the Board of Missions had done a presentation of different opportunities available, and Alice was fascinated when she heard about Tanganyika. She remembered that the gentleman shared with the class that every organization has its areas of strength 
and its areas of weakness, and the bottom of the barrel at that time in Lutheran missionary work was, and the place you didn't want to go was Liberia. So Alice <coughs> says to apply to the Board of Foreign Missions, fully convinced that she was moving in the right direction, the direction given to her when she boldly prayed for an answer. Life had never been easy for Alice, but the church had always taken care of her. And serving the church by giving back in this way was just the right thing to do. And Alice knew, she knew deep in her bones that she was doing what God wanted her to do. And so on the day that Alice was to, re that Alice was to receive her assignment, she was confident, she was ready, she was ready to go to Tanganyika. But of course she wasn't assigned to Tanganyika. Yeah, Alice was assigned to Liberia. And her reaction was exactly what you would expect from this determined young woman. She did not blindly accept the word of the party. Instead, she marched up to the man in charge and she said, excuse me, but I believe there's been a mistake. I requested Tanganyika and my assignment is Liberia. But what Alice received in return was exactly what we sometimes read the most and that of course was the truth. And the man in charge said, Alice, we need you in Liberia. We're building a new hospital and we're desperately in need of skilled nurses. We need you to help us start a collegiate nursing school. And Alice told me that at this point, she said, okay, God, if that is what you want me to do, I will do it. And so off she went. And over the next few years, Alice worked in all aspects of setting up that nursing school from designing curriculum to going out and finding eligible students, which was not easy, to teaching the classes once the students were gathered. And her first class of four young women graduated in 1965. Alice worked in Liberia for a total of eight years, training up nurses as she had been taught, but in a part of the world that was very different from anything she had ever known. She remained in Liberia, embracing that call and loving the people she served until the Board of Missions determined that it was no longer safe for her to stay. Civil unrest had made it far too dangerous. She grieved over the thought of leaving. She'd grown to love these people and the life that she had in Liberia, and she prayed about it. You, you know by now that she prayed about it. But when a student from her first graduating class was brutally murdered in the Civil War, Alice knew that it was time to leave. Now the work started by Alice and others continues even today. Despite being attacked and looted during the Liberian Civil War, the Phoebe Hospital has never stopped giving care. And nurses continue to be graduated from the program begun by this young woman who followed God's call to serve in a faraway land. And as for Alice, she didn't stop praying. And in praying for guidance, she found herself being called to teach in the exotic mission field of Durham, North Carolina. Positions were open at the Duke University School of Nursing, and Alice applied, but she was told that her credentials were unacceptable. So Alice, um, well, she possessed a bachelor's degree in nursing and a master's degree in education. Alice didn't have the advanced degree required to teach in this field. The truth was that even though she had established a collegiate school of nursing from the ground up, if she wanted to teach nursing in the States, she would have to earn yet another degree. And I'm sure you're not surprised to hear that Alice enrolled at the University of North Carolina, and she earned her master's degree in public health, and then she returned to Duke, where they offered her a job, and she taught until that program ended seven years later, but that didn't stop Alice. No, 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 she went back to the University of North Carolina, and she taught in that very department from which she had graduated for another seven years. And finally, at the age of 65, Alice retired, and I'm exhausted. <laughs> she moved to a Lutheran retirement community, and as some of you may be able to relate, she loved it there. This was now her new community. This was her village, and she built relationships there. She cared for the people of Twin Lakes just as she had cared for people all of her adult life. And Alice continued to seek God's guidance. Now, Alice and I had spent some time talking in her room until she had to go to her occupational therapy session. And as we walked down the hallway, Alice greeted everyone. She greeted everyone by name. 
and she chatted happily with her therapist and with the others in the therapy room, asking about their day, asking about their family, remembering things they had done in the past, and after a bit, we went to the dining room for lunch. Alice found us a table away from the crowd, and we sort of tucked into our soup while we continued our conversation. And after a few minutes, Alice put her spoon down, and she folded her hands and put them in her lap. And she looked at me very seriously. And she said, you know, for most of my life, I've been really angry. And then she told me that around the time she turned 80, God began to show her that she was carrying around some unnecessary burdens. Alice was still angry with her father, and she was getting a message that it was time to let that anger go. He'd been dead for 30 years, and Alice said it was just getting in the way of me getting things done. I know, right? She told me that she prayed one of the strangest prayers ever when she told God that she believed that her father was probably waiting outside the gate of heaven, kept there by her anger, and there was time for God to let him in. His actions in life were horrific, and they were wrong, and there's no stepping back from that. But Alice also understood that God's grace was greater than her father's sinfulness, and Alice understood that her life was valuable, and that her life of faithfulness would not be diminished by her father's sin. And Alice told me that of all of the life-changing decisions she had ever made, and there had been several, this act of forgiveness was by far the most difficult, but also the most rewarding. And so, at the age of 80, Alice experienced resurrection and new life. Letting go of that one thing that had been weighing her down and preventing her from living a life full, a full life of Christ. And so great was that revelation that Alice now had a new mission. And that mission was to share her story with her peers and with the staff at Twin Lakes, and then when I met Alice on that September day, she shared her story with me. And she told me that she never passed up an opportunity to encourage others to let go of anger and to forgive those who had wronged them. Even if the wrong seemed insurmountable, they weren't insurmountable for God. We can't let them rule our lives or have power over us, she said. Alice knew the rewards that could be found in releasing burdens because she had experienced that firsthand and Alice prayed sincerely that everyone might know that same joy that she knew. Now, today, I was tasked with preaching to you on our chosen texts, which deal with the right family relationships and putting on the armor of God in order to be strong in the Lord and to tie in the ELCA social statement on women and justice, and that's a whole lot of stuff to cover in one sermon. But I believe that Alice Dietz met that goal in the very example of her life. In her understanding of family systems and what is and what is not acceptable behavior. And in her faithful listening to, to the Spirit's nudging throughout her life. And in girding up herself and equipping herself with God's gifts of truth and righteousness and peace and faith. And in standing up to the powers of evil for the sake of others. And in educating and empowering women, even when the forces around her were doing the opposite. But I also believe that Alice's most important lesson is that she never stopped praying. And in fact, if we continue today's reading in Ephesians, the next few verses say this. Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am the ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Alice Dietz never stopped praying. And on the day that she and I met, it was no different. After lunch, she was tired and she was ready for a nap. So when we got back to her room, Alice helped me help her get situated back on the side of her bed. You'll have to help me with my socks and shoes, she said. So I knelt down on the floor beside her. And as I gently removed those shoes and those socks from Alice's tiny, cracked and tired feet, the feet of an old missionary nurse, 
I felt the presence of God as strongly as I ever have. And this many years later, I still remember wishing that that moment wouldn't end. And then I sat down on the bed next to Alice, and we prayed together, and we thanked God for blessing both of us with each other and with the walk book, with so many examples of faith, and for the time that we had had together that day. Then I helped Alice lie back on her bed to take a nap. And then we both started to laugh because in that entire procedure, we had forgotten one very critical step. We had forgotten to turn down the sheets and the blankets of Alice's freshly made bed, and now Alice was on top of them. <laughs> so not wanting to go through the trouble of putting her shoes back on and getting out of bed again, Alice went right back into teaching mode, instructing me how to unmake that bed while she was still in it, just as she had for so many of her students over the years. Finally, when she was tucked in and she was comfortable, Alice asked me, how long will it take you to get that bed? And I told her it would be about eight hours. So she looked at the clock and she did a little figuring, and she said, I'll be praying for you the entire time. <coughs> And I know she did. I never saw Alice again. Alice died 11 months later, and I didn't find out until three weeks after. But my life is richer for her story and her life of faith, and perhaps now yours might be too. So Alice's mission continues.
Blessed are you, joyful Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You live the perfect unity of love. You have brought together the women of this congregation in friendship and sisterhood, and reach their enrich their understanding and experience of each, strengthen their commitment and loyalty to each, and deepen their trust as sisters. And may their blessings be to each in praise and thanksgiving. We ask for your blessings. Almighty God, we call upon your younger women in this congregation so as to help us grow in the future of this church. Let us never be set in our ways that we refuse to hear the voice of youth, so, or have so firm a grip in our own contributions that we refuse to hear theirs. Let the youth be candid and not cruel, and keep them dreaming their dreams that you approve of and living in the spirit of Jesus, the crucified, who now rules the world. In praise and thanksgiving, Yes. 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 Oh God, you created all people in your image. We thank you for your astonishing variety of races and cultures in this world, enrich in our lives by ever widening circles of friendship. And show us your presence in those who differ from most of us until our knowledge of your love is perfect in our love for all your children. Help us to find ways to stop trafficking of, children, of young girls and women, and help the incarcerated as they are free to live their lives once again. In praise and thanksgiving. Yes. 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 Mighty and merciful God, you sent Jesus Christ to heal the broken lives. We ask that today you send healing in doctors and nurses and bless the technology and medicine. We claim your promise of wholeness as we pray for those who are ill in body and mind and long for your healing touch as we pray for Margaret, Warren, Henry, Marzette, Ronald, Marlon, Sue, Cora, Martha, and Helen, and those we name quietly or out loud now. May the weak make the weak strong, the sick healthy, and the broken whole, and confirm those who serve them as agents of your love. In praise and thanksgiving. Yes. Yes. Eternal God, in your perfect realm, so no sword is drawn, but the sword of righteousness. And there is no strength but the strength of love. So mightily spread abroad your spirit that all peoples may be gathered under the banner of the Prince of Peace as your children. Let there be peace in this world. We ask for your protection for the all service men and women. Be with them and keep them safe until they are returned home to their loved ones. To your, you be dominion and glory now and forever. In praise and thanksgiving. Yes. 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 We ask that you bless this church and all other churches and the leaders that are with each of them. We pray for the leadership of Reverend Bruner and Lois Ann Griffith, president of the Women's Organization for the Lower Susquehanna Synod, that they may go forth doing the work as you wish them to do in your name. We pray for the Evangelical Church of America, asking for your guidance for Bishop Elizabeth Eaton and Bishop James Dunlap. In praise and thanksgiving. Yes. Yes. Father, we now say together the prayer as you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And by the name of the Lord, the power of the Lord. Almighty God bless you, renew the risen life of Christ within you, and bring forth in you the gift of the Holy Spirit.